let me fiddle with my microphone. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Meg. That was really a nice introduction, and I appreciate it. Um, thank you all for coming today, and thank you for the invitation. I've always wanted to come to the University of Michigan because it's such an exciting place for ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I also want to start by apologizing for the way my voice is right now. I'm not always sounding like a duck, but um, I hope you can still hear me okay, and I hope I don't break down in a coughing fit while I'm talking. Um, <clears throat> So the work that I have been doing um, in my career, and especially now that I've gotten to Stanford, has really centered on the multifaceted ways in which global change affects infectious disease in both humans and natural ecosystems. Before I get started talking about that work, I want to briefly acknowledge my collaborators um, and my mentors who Meg um, listed before, and also the funding that we've received from the National Science Foundation and from several organizations within Stanford. So this is kind of the thrust of the problem here. We have multifaceted areas of global change that have been in fact impacting infectious disease in both humans and natural ecosystems. So these areas of global change include climate change, land use change, species invasions, species extinctions, global trade and travel and movement. And all of these things tend to influence infectious disease, which is caused by living organisms or in some cases, debatably living organisms. Um, and all of these changes in infectious disease can potentially impact their host populations. So to be a little bit more concrete with an example that maybe some of you are familiar with already, um, one of the areas where we've seen global change impacting infectious disease is in rabies and the spillover of rabies from vampire bats into cattle and humans. What we've seen in parts of Latin America is that deforestation combined with increased cattle ranching near the edges of forests, has created lots of opportunities for cattle to be right in the edge in contact with lots of vampire bats. And these vampire bats are potentially getting more abundant because they have this abundant source of food. And this has led to increased opportunities for rabies spillover. So we now have an emerging problem with rabies in these systems. Another great example that some of you might be familiar with um, from wildlife is the monarch butterfly, which most of us know spends its summers in northern parts of North America and then spends its winters in parts of Mexico. Um, and at least traditionally, this has been the case. Most of these populations have migrated south for the winter. And one of the functions of this migration has been to shed some of its really virulent protozoan parasites, um, or in some cases, cull the individuals that are really heavily parasitized. But because of this combination of climate warming in some of the warmer parts of the, winter of the summer range, along with planting exotic milkweeds that stay green year round, we are now starting to see some of these monarch populations no longer migrating south. And this has led to a huge buildup of protozoan parasites, which are really virulent to these monarchs. So again, we have interacting multiple dimensions of global change here that are influencing infectious disease. So my work more broadly is trying to address this question of how will diseases and their impacts shift in a changing world. And one thing that's challenging about addressing this question in many systems is that infectious disease is almost always embedded in these complex ecological communities. So in many cases, we have interacting multiple host species, sometimes multiple vector species that transmit disease from host to host. We often have multiple interacting pathogens, species, or genotypes multiple interacting aspects of global change. So lots of possible arrows here. Any one of these arrows can be nonlinear. So any of these interactions can have nonlinear impacts. And the emerging effect of multiple interactions can also be nonlinear. So that makes it pretty hard to predict the emergent impacts of global change in these nonlinear and complex systems. And one of the tools that disease ecologists have used really effectively to deal with this complexity and nonlinearity is mathematical models that they're really confronting with empirical data. So using statistical inference to move from empirical data to parameterized mathematical models to predict transmission dynamics and to try to understand their impacts. So today I'm going to focus mainly on two areas of global change. Um, it's actually, they're listed in the reverse order that I'll talk about them, but um, species invasions in the first section. I'll talk about how species invasions influence infectious disease in natural ecosystems. And then I'll move on to talking about how climate and climate change may influence infectious disease in human, uh, not human ecosystems, human populations. So first, species invasions and shared disease. I'm going to talk about how shared pathogens influence the outcome of competition between their host species. Um, and particularly in the case where we have invasive and native hosts coexisting and competing with each other. 
I'm going to talk about this really charismatic plant fungus called Black Fingers of Death that you will learn to love. In the climate change and infectious disease section, I'm going to talk about vector-borne disease, or mosquito-transmitted disease in particular, and how it responds to temperature. And I want to highlight right now, before I forget, that Daniel Weichel, who's sitting right here in the third row, has worked a lot with me on this work. And I want to really acknowledge his great work on this. So getting started with the first part here, how do shared pathogens affect the outcome of invasion when you have invasive species competing with native species? Okay, so many of us ecologists are familiar with this hypothesis that invasive species often arrive in their, in their invaded region lacking some of their natural enemies, like their pathogens and their specialist herbivores. But one of the things we don't think about as frequently is that if these invasive species are any at all closely related to the native species, they may actually share pathogens with the native species, either because they're bringing along pathogens that can also infect the natives, or because they're already susceptible to a pathogen that's already present in this new region. So regardless of which mechanism it is, the fear here is that the invasive species, maybe it's less well defended against pathogens, it has a weedier life history, for example, and it might sort of build up and become a reservoir host that can amplify the disease, which can spill over onto the native species. And so the concern here in this case is that if you have a shared pathogen that's infecting both invasive and native species, the pathogen could actually be a competitive weapon that the invader is using against the native species. And this is the kind of thing that we've seen playing out in some of our invaded grasslands in the US. So I'm going to specifically ask how shared pathogens affect the outcome of competition between native and exotic species in the Inner Mountain West, um, which is this sort of semi-arid, shrub step grassland type ecosystem. Um, this particular site where I worked is in Utah. We have some Utah fans out there, <laughs> I see. Um, so prior to invasion, most of the system looked more or less like this. This is what the semi-arid shrub step looks like. It has a combination of these shrubs, some bunch grasses that you can see here, some small annuals growing in the inner spaces. You can see that it's a relatively open canopy. It's not completely dense and filled with plants. And it has a mixture of plants. It's not the most diverse ecosystem you've ever seen, but it certainly has more than one species of plant. Around the turn of the 20th century, we saw a massive invasion by this exotic annual grass called cheatgrass that originated in probably Turkey, somewhere in Europe. And now most of this region looks a lot more like this. So we now see these extremely dense monocultures, essentially monocultures, of annual grass. You can see that this grass, when it dies back for the year, or not dies back, it actually dies for the year, it leaves behind this really dense thatch that decreases the fire return interval. So now we have more frequent fires. It's also really bad for grazing. A lot of this area is ranch land. And these seeds have these barbs on them that point in one direction. So the seeds tend to get stuck up in the cattle's noses, and so the cattle hate it, the farmers hate it, the cattle don't really like to eat it. They'll selectively eat the native species instead. Um, and so it's just really environmentally destructive. It's really a hated plant in this area. In addition to the massive impacts it's having, it's also brought along this fungal seed pathogen called black fingers of death, which literally infects the seeds and if it's able to kill them, or sometimes even when it doesn't kill them, it grows these fungal conidia coming out of the, of the seed. Um, so it's feeding off of the seed endosperm here. And you can see in this case, the seed started to germinate but was killed before it could actually fully germinate or fully establish itself. Um, so mirroring the really high density of seeds in the system, this pathogen is, for, is reaching really, really high density. So tens of thousands of killed seeds per square meter. Now, I should also say that the, the native community produces on the order of 100 to 1,000 seeds per square meter, whereas the exotic cheatgrass produces 30,000 to 100,000 seeds. So we have a really huge increase in the density of seeds in the system. I know many of you are probably wondering whether this is a native pathogen or not. We don't actually know. We think it was probably cosmopolitan worldwide and was probably present before the invasion of cheatgrass. But certainly no one ever noticed it because seed densities were so low before. Whereas now we have this huge density of killed seeds in the seed bank. So not only does this pathogen infect cheatgrass and kill cheatgrass seeds, but it also kills the grass seeds of all the native grasses. So it can infect and kill. It doesn't kill all the seeds, but it kills seeds of each of the species that are still present in the system. So here we have this system where we have invasive cheatgrass and native bunch grasses, and they're sharing this fungal pathogen. We think that cheatgrass is fueling the abundance of this pathogen by simply dumping so many seeds into the system. 
Now, I mentioned that once the seed gets infected, it's, it becomes basically a race for survival between seed and pathogen. So if the seed can germinate quickly, it might survive. But if it doesn't germinate quickly enough, it'll get killed. Now, we know that cheatgrass is able to germinate basically within a day or two of any rainfall, whereas the native grasses tend to take a week or 10 days. So you can imagine this gives the, the native grasses a dis disadvantage when they're infected with this pathogen. So what we hypothesized is that faster germination leads to higher tolerance of infection. Or in other words, these, these exotic seeds are more likely to survive once they're infected. So when we think about the impact of this pathogen, what we expected was that even though cheatgrass was fueling the growth of the pathogen, the heavier impact might be felt by the native grass because they're more likely to get killed once they're infected. So our hypothesis is that the net impact of the pathogen would be negative on the native bunch grasses and might actually be positive on the exotic cheatgrass because it's sort of winning in competition by using this pathogen as a competitive weapon. So this is the hypothesis that we wanted to test in this system. <clears throat> so I'm going to outline this approach. And later on, I want to point out that I think this approach is really broadly useful across many different systems and questions. And I'll try to show another example of how this approach is useful. But what we did in particular is we started by building population growth models of the native and exotic grass species in the presence of the pathogen and building in the demographic impact that the pathogen was having on both plant species. So we build the population growth model. We then parameterize it by collecting empirical data in the field. So we did experiments and made observations in the field to measure basically the demographic rates that go into this population growth model. And then here's the magic of the model, and this is why we actually need the model, is that it allows us to, quote unquote, experimentally remove the pathogen from the system and back out what the outcome of competition would have been in the absence of the pathogen. So we can compare the outcome with and without the pathogen. So this is really the purpose of constructing this model, is it allows us to um, incorporate this kind of complex and nonlinear potential feedback and really infer what the impact might be in the system. So this is all I'm going to say about the model. I'm going to really briefly introduce the kind of structure of model that we're using. This is the cheatgrass life cycle. So it's an annual grass. It starts at the beginning of the growing season, which is the fall, with just a population of seeds that are sitting in the seed bank. Those seeds have to survive infection germinate, compete, and then go on to produce new seeds that go into the seed bank for the next year. So it's this annual life cycle where the growing season is basically from the late fall into the, into the spring, and then it's dry for the summer. So population growth, we're just modeling as a discrete time population growth model. Per capita growth is just a function of the probability of surviving infection, germinating, um, the impact of competition, and then the seed production. These are all just multiplied together. And each of these traits, shown in a different color, are, are things that we measured in the field. So survival of infection, um, as many of you who are disease ecologists probably know, a lot of pathogens have a density-dependent response. So infection depends on the density of hosts. It also depends on the transmission rates within and between species. And it depends on their tolerance, or their ability to germinate and survive once they've been infected. Competition depends on plant density and also the interaction coefficients within and between species. So we have a similar model for the native grass, except that it's a perennial. So we start the year with some seeds. They have to survive infection, germinate, compete. And then they have the opportunity to mature into this long-lived perennial bunch grass stage that can survive year after year. And that's the stage that produces seeds at the end of the year. So in the perennial population, we have both seeds and adults that survive between years. But otherwise, the model is very similar. And all the demographic rates are similar. So the two modes of interaction in this system are with shared infection and competition within and between species. So we essentially measured all the things that are listed on this slide. But I'm going to just show the infection and competition because those are the kind of interesting interaction effects. So we parameterized the model by going out to this really beautiful part of Utah called Skull Valley. Um, we focused on the native grass squirrel tail, or Elemis elamoides, which is one of the more common of the remnant native species. And then we used the exotic grass cheatgrass as our invasive grass, which is the only invasive grass in this, or the only common and important invasive grass in this system. Now I want to highlight here, I don't know how well you can tell, but you can see there's a fence here. We worked within the fence because that's where the native bunch grasses still occur. We don't see any native bunch grasses outside of the fence because grazing is so heavy here that the native bunch grasses get killed and eaten, basically. So 
one important caveat here is that we're within the context of excluding grazing, that's where our results apply, because that's where we were able to actually find these plants. And that's actually an area where cheatgrass and squirrel tail do co-occur naturally. So this is what our competition experiment looked like. Essentially, we just varied the background density of both cheatgrass and squirrel tail. So here we have a plot that has a single squirrel tail individual per square meter, and here we have you know, part of a plot that has multiple squirrel tail individuals per square meter. So we're varying them from low density to high density, and then we're measuring the seed production of a focal squirrel tail individual and a focal cheatgrass individual inside each of those plots. And we do the same thing for a gradient of cheatgrass density. So what this allows us to do is to estimate the per capita effect of competition within and between species. So we're basically looking at how much seed reduction, how much reduction in seed production does each additional individual of each species cause the other. So this is kind of what the data look like. We're looking at seed production, per capita seed production on the y-axis, and cheatgrass density on the x-axis. And this is for cheatgrass seed production. So what we're looking at here is intraspecific competition. And we see a classic signature here of intraspecific competition. So when cheatgrass is growing with few conspecifics, it produces a lot of seeds, up to 100 or 200 per individual. But then when it gets in these really dense growing conditions, it's down to about two seeds per individual. So it's a really strong effect of intraspecific competition. But when we look at cheatgrass per capita seed production as a function of squirrel tail density, we see a much weaker signature of competition, if anything at all. We see basically no signature of competition here. So this is a classic signature of a competitive niche difference. Cheatgrass is competing much more strongly within species than it is between species with squirrel tail. And we see the parallel effect for squirrel tail per capita seed production. So here we have per capita seeds for squirrel tail on the y-axis and squirrel tail adult density. We see that, again, classic signature of competition, where per capita seed production is declining with conspecific density. But when we look at squirrel tail seed production versus cheatgrass density, we see much lower signature of competition. So again, classic signature of a competitive niche difference here. So this was actually a huge surprise to us, because we had assumed that cheatgrass was having a big competitive effect on the native grasses. And that's why we saw the native grasses being extirpated when cheatgrass was present. Um, but actually, there's a really strong niche difference here that is going to predispose the system towards coexistence. So, and in retrospect, this kind of makes sense because these species are actually coexisting within the area where we looked. Um, but nonetheless, this was sort of the first surprising result that we had. Next, one of the cool things about this system is that it allows us to measure transmission rates. So those of us working in disease ecology know that it's very hard often to measure the per capita transmission rates. And, and how that changes with species density. But in seeds, we can actually do this. So we take, these are petri dishes with blue filter paper, and you can see the white seeds here are field collected killed seeds that have black fingers of death. And we vary the density and species of those black fingers of death seeds, ranging from low density of cheatgrass to high density of cheatgrass and low density of squirrel tail to high density of squirrel tail. And then we use these pink dyed target seeds, which were surface sterilized, as sort of the response measure. So what we're looking at is how many of these target seeds become infected as a function of the density and species of infection in the petri dish. So here's what we see. This is black fingers of death number. Um, this is scaled up to the per meter squared times 1,000 scale. But this is the density of black fingers of death in the petri dish on the x-axis. And the fraction of the cheatgrass target seeds, those pink seeds that became infected on the y-axis. And what you see is the classic signature of density-dependent transmission here. So the more killed cheatgrass seeds in the petri dish, the larger the fraction of target cheatgrass seeds became infected. The other important thing is that it didn't matter which source species we were using. So whether you had killed squirrel tail seeds or killed cheatgrass seeds, they were equally capable of infecting those susceptible cheatgrass seeds. So we did the same thing for target squirrel tail individuals. And what we see, again, is this pattern of density-dependent transmission. But what we realize right away is that there's a big difference in susceptibility here. So for the same density of black fingers of death in the petri dish, we see a lot fewer squirrel tail seeds getting infected than cheatgrass seeds. This was also a really interesting surprise for us, because we had assumed that the pathogen was equally capable of infecting all the native grasses and the exotic grass. But actually, it appears that the pathogen is doing better infecting the really abundant exotic grass than it is the very rare native grass, um, which makes a lot of sense evolutionarily if you think about it that way. 
Okay, so along with these, we measured all those other demographic rates that go into the model. We parameterized the model, and then we used the model to calculate growth rates when rare. And essentially what this is, is it's the per capita rate of increase for each species when it's rare, but its competitor is at equilibrium. So the idea here is that this is kind of a continuous metric for the outcome of competition, because if a species can increase when it's rare and its competitor is at equilibrium, that means it's going to be able to stably persist in the community. Because if it gets depressed to low density, it'll increase again. So if both species are able to increase when rare, then coexistence is stable, because any species that's depressed to low density will reinvade. So rather than giving us a binary outcome, it gives us sort of a continuous outcome of how capable of invading when rare is each species. So in this case, anything greater than one indicates that a species is, is stably persisting in the system. So here's what our outcome of competition looks like in the fully parameterized model. Let me walk you through what this is. The cheatgrass growth rate when rare is here on the x-axis. So anything greater than one means cheatgrass is stably persisting. The squirrel tail growth rate when rare is on the y-axis. Again, anything greater than one. And then these dots represent samples from the posterior distribution. So we decided that rather than calculating a single point estimate of the outcome, we wanted to sample from the posterior distribution what is the most likely outcome and how much uncertainty do we have in that outcome. And what I'm showing in black is that the most likely outcome of this model is actually coexistence. And I sort of hinted at that earlier, that we have this strong competitive niche difference, so we might actually expect to see coexistence in this system. But we can't rule out the possibility of squirrel tail monoculture or cheatgrass monoculture. But essentially, the most likely outcome is coexistence. So now what we want to do is take the fully parameterized model and remove the pathogen and compare the outcome. So here we've done that. What you see right away is that these plots are not very different. You can squint and you might find some differences. But more or less, the main outcome is that the pathogen is not having an overwhelming effect on the outcome of competition. And this is actually really surprising because we find in the model and in, in the empirical world that the pathogen is killing tens of thousands of seeds per square meter. So it's having a huge effect at the population level, but at the community level, it's having very little impact on the outcome of competition. And I'll get into why that is in a minute. But first, I want to sort of zoom in on what the differences are between these two plots. So what I'm going to do is subtract this plot from this plot and basically show the relative shift in the outcome of competition. And basically what the pathogen does is it makes coexistence or squirrel tail winning more likely, and it makes cheatgrass winning less likely. So this is in contrast to our initial hypothesis. This is the native grass is actually benefiting from this pathogen that's spilling over, even though it, it is spilling over and getting infected. So if anything, in contrast to our hypothesis, the pathogen, first of all, isn't having an overwhelming impact on the outcome of competition. But second of all, if anything, it's benefiting the native grass. So again, this was our hypothesis, that cheatgrass was fueling the growth of this shared pathogen, which would be differentially harmful to squirrel tail. But we find that it's not actually differentially harmful to squirrel tail. Because although squirrel tail was slightly less tolerant, what we found when we really investigated these population growth models was that the net impact was positive on squirrel tail. Because not only was squirrel tail less susceptible, so it was less likely to get infected in the first place, but also squirrel tail has this perennial life history strategy that really buffers against the losses of seeds. So the really important thing that we found was that squirrel tail has these long-lived adult stages that live, I mean, it's greater than 99% survival. So population growth in this species is all about the survival of adults. And it really doesn't matter if you kill a few seeds, because those adults are still alive, and they're producing 4,000 seeds each every year. So essentially what we learned is that not only in this case does squirrel tail have a buffered life history, and so it's not negatively affected by this pathogen, but actually in many cases we might expect perennial grasses to have a buffered life history and not be as susceptible to seed pathogen impacts. Whereas annual grasses only have their seeds carrying over year after year. So killing seeds is much more important for annual grasses than for perennials. So what I'm getting at here with this whole point is that invader-driven pathogen spillover doesn't necessarily harm the native species. So contrary to our expectation that global change means worse disease outcomes, in this case, invasion doesn't necessarily mean pathogen spillover is harming the native species. There's lots of things harming the native species, but the pathogen is not one of them in this case. Now, I want to do a quick aside here that I put in specifically for this audience because Meg said you guys were interested in multi-pathogen communities. 
Um, and I also want to point out just how useful this kind of method can be for dealing with these complex and nonlinear systems. So again, the approach is build a population growth model, go out and measure the life history and demographic parameters empirically, and then compare the outcome with and without the process of interest. So in this case, it was the pathogen. And I want to show just a, a slide or two as an example of how we've used this in a different system. These are the salt marsh trematodes in California. If you don't know about these, they're super cool. They're parasitic castrators. They infect these little snails. There's 18 species or more of these trematodes. And they have a competitive dominance hierarchy. So they can actually attack and kill each other within the snail. So you pretty much only ever see snails with a single infection. And if two parasites arrive in the same snail, we can predict pretty well which one is going to win. So in that kind of system, we don't expect to see coexistence. We expect competitive dominance by the most dominant trematode species. So my question in this system is, how can we ever get coexistence of all these 18 parasite species that need to use the snail? And my hypothesis was that it was a competition colonization trade-off. So in other words, those subordinate competitors might be really good at colonizing new snails that are uninfected. So what we did is we went out and measured the evidence for this competition colonization trade-off. And we did find that it actually occurs. So decreasing competitive ability going this way, the lesser competitors, on average, had higher colonization rates empirically. So you might expect a trade-off to look negative, but in this case, it looks positive. Um, you can see that it, it's not a perfect trade-off by any means, but there is a trend towards a trade-off. But when we plug this into a population growth model, we find that actually it's only strong enough to maintain the coexistence about half of the species. So it allows us to really identify what are the important coexistence mechanisms in this system by basically parameterizing the model and then comparing the model outcome with and without the process of interest. So I'll move on from that. I wanted to just sort of show that as an aside. Now moving on to the second part, I want to talk about climate change and its impacts on infectious disease in humans, and specifically how temperature affects vector-borne disease. This is a really important issue, as we've seen lots of emerging vector-borne diseases recently spreading throughout the Americas. A lot of people are discussing whether, for example, the emergence of Zika has anything to do with climate. Um, and this, this bears on that question. So this is work that I started with a working group um, founded by the, or funded by the Luce Foundation. This was held at NCs um, back in 2010 or so, and these are my collaborators in this working group. Um, the idea here is that temperature affects malaria transmission. So we started off looking at malaria. We're going to expand to more diseases later on. Many of us know malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. So in order to move from human to human, you have to have a mosquito bite you, become infectious, and then bite another person. So because there's this part of the life cycle that takes place within the mosquito, the mosquito is small-bodied and cold-blooded, it's sensitive to temperature. So its vital rates are going to change really sensitively with temperature. And the incubation period of the parasite within the mosquito is also sensitive to temperature. So people have known this for a really long time. Um, but we're really interested in the potential impacts of climate and climate change in malaria. So to think about how temperature affects malaria transmission, we have to think about how it affects the processes that control transmission. And these are actually mostly mosquito and parasite traits. So things like mosquito biting rates, mos mosquitoes' ability to acquire and transmit the parasite, their density, their survival, the extrinsic incubation period, or the amount of time it takes a parasite once the mosquito takes that infectious blood meal to actually become infected. And then the human recovery rate is also important here. And we decided to use a model for r naught, which describes the invasion of a disease into a fully susceptible population. So again, if a single case is introduced into a fully susceptible population, how many secondary cases do we expect? This is sort of a classic epidemiological metric that's often used because it's a nice, simple, static measure of transmission potential. And all I want you to know from this equation, this has been developed over literally over 100 years. Um, and this is, we're not the first to use this equation. But what I want you to notice is that it's a nonlinear function of these mostly mosquito and parasite traits. So because it's mosquito and parasite traits affecting R0, we expect it to be temperature sensitive, because we expect all of these traits to be temperature sensitive. So we're not the first people to think that malaria transmission should be temperature sensitive. And in fact, there's been a cottage industry of models in this area. Um, here's just an example. This is a projected change in R0 throughout Tanzania with warmer climates. And what I want you to know here is that essentially the change is expected to be either zero or positive throughout Tanzania. 
Here's another example of this kind of model, projecting future responses to climate change. And this is the change in the number of infectious bites per human per year. And again, we see a positive scale here, basically throughout sub-Saharan Africa, with the small exception of kind of the desert fringe right here, where it's expected to get too dry. But otherwise, these models are really broadly projecting that we're going to see huge increases in malaria transmission with warmer temperatures. And this has really been a huge cause for alarm, because you know, we're actually making progress toward malaria elimination, but that could be undone if climate change is making it more suitable for transmission. But one common feature of all of these previous models, literally all of them, is that they're assuming that vital rates of mosquitoes and parasites change monotonically, and in, in most cases, linearly with temperature. So they're assuming, for example, that the parasite development rate within the mosquito speeds up with temperature, and the mosquito mortality rate also speeds up with temperature. And so you end up with this unimodal relationship between temperature and r naught that's driven by the trade-off between faster parasite development and shorter mosquito lifespan. So these mosquitoes pretty er, these mosquitoes, these models pretty much universally predict an optimal temperature for transmission of around 31 or 32 degrees Celsius. But we knew from looking at ectotherm physiology, both theory and empirical work, across a whole variety of taxa and traits, that these traits are very rarely just linearly increasing with temperature. And in fact, most of the time, traits increase from a critical thermal minimum up to an optimum, and then they often drop off pretty steeply above that optimum, back to zero at a critical thermal maximum. So these performance traits could be things like biting rate and reproduction rate and development rate and mortality rate. So we know this, I mean, this is very, very well established from empirical work and theory in ectotherm physiology, but it hadn't been applied to mosquito or to malaria in particular uh, transmission models. So very simply, our goal was to integrate these nonlinear thermal responses into malaria transmission models. So we went into the literature and we looked for empirical experiments where people had experimentally held mosquitoes at different constant temperatures in the lab and had measured biting rate and development rate and survival and so on. And we extracted all these data and fit nonlinear, both symmetric and asymmetric thermal responses. We plugged all those into an R0 versus temperature model. So now each of these parameters is a function of temperature. So we get an overall relationship between R0 and temperature. And then we validated it by comparing it with field transmission data matched with temperature. <clears throat> So essentially, this is what we found. The data for mosquitoes, unsurprisingly, are just like all other ectotherms, where we see these nonlinear thermal responses. So in this case, mosquito egg to adult development rate is going to zero around 16, peaking around 28 degrees Celsius, going back to zero around 34. So strong evidence for a hump-shaped thermal response here. And again, when we look at all those mosquito and parasite traits that drive transmission, we see hump-shaped thermal responses in every case. So now, what's the impact when we put all these into our R0, our overall transmission equation? What we now predict is that transmission is optimized at 25 degrees Celsius. So if you recall, those previous models that use linear thermal responses predict a 32 degree optimum. So we're predicting a 7 degree difference in optimal temperature, temperature here. And for those of you not so familiar with Celsius, 25 degrees Celsius is about 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a much more moderate temperature than most people might expect for malaria to be optimal. So we wanted to validate this. And we, I have to say, we got pretty lucky in this case that this group of independent researchers had collected a database of entomological inoculation rate, which is basically the number of infectious mosquitoes per human per year from across Africa over 30 years. So tons and tons of data, basically, on the sort of mosquito force of infection in malaria. And what we did is we paired those with average temperature during the transmission season. And here's what we found. So what we see is that, first of all, there's quite a bit of scatter in these data, as we might expect, because temperature is certainly not the only driver of variation in transmission here. But we can see that there's pretty strong support that the optimum is around 25 degrees, and that there's certainly support that around 28 and above, we're not seeing more and more transmission at these really warm temperatures. So there's very little support for the 32 degree optimum here. What I'm showing in the filled circles are the maximum within each bin of 10 temperature points, which we thought sort of indicated the places where malaria was least under control and therefore 
potentially most susceptible to changing with temperature. Because when you have really effective vector control, you might not see a lot of malaria responding to temperature regardless of the temperature. So thinking about the implications of this for climate change, there are certainly some places here where temperatures are currently below the optimum. And we might expect warmer temperatures to mean higher transmission rates, or at least higher potential for transmission. But we also have plenty of places that are currently probably in really highly endemic regions where climate is already pretty close to optimal for transmission. And any future warming is not expected to make climate more suitable. And in fact, the climate becomes less suitable for transmission. So in these cases, I want to be very careful to say, it's possible that warmer temperatures could slow down transmission in some of these places. It's also possible that mosquitoes and parasites could adapt and their, their thermal responses could increase. But at the very least, we don't expect to see more malaria transmission in these already warm places because of warming. So we wanted to map this a little bit more specifically. Where do we expect to, do, where do we expect to see increases and decreases in malaria transmission? And so here we plotted, basically, uh, this is an overlay of human population density with the number of months per year where temperatures are really suitable for transmission. So it's sort of a, we were trying to get at this, this like malaria hotspot region. So currently, this malaria hotspot, currently, well, we did this model a few years ago, but in 2013, let's say, the malaria hotspot was coastal West Africa, where we really had high densities of people exposed to really suitable climates for a lot of the year. But with warmer temperatures, we're going to expect to see that hotspot shifting towards the higher elevation Albertine Rift region, which is also really densely populated and currently has a little bit below optimal temperature. So these are the places where we really expect to see, like we really should be concerned about increases in malaria transmission in these areas. And this is where we should plan the most for increased malaria transmission. In other places, we expect the climate to become less suitable. So it's possible that we really won't see very much transmission in these places. Or again, maybe we'll see very little change in these places. And I think we still need further research to see whether we're really starting to see those declines in the warmest places yet or not. So the big take home here is that climate change may speed transmission in cool places, but also potentially slow down transmission in warm places. So before I move on from this section, I want to talk a little bit more broadly about this pattern. So I mentioned that ectotherms in general have this very consistent unimodal thermal response pattern across most of their traits. So we know that there are a lot of vector-borne diseases out there that are transmitted by ectotherms. So we expect that there should be a more general relationship between R0 and temperature that we might be able to estimate across many different systems. So we currently have a grant funded by NSF EEID where we're going to develop a more general framework for understanding temperature-dependent transmission, particularly for vector-borne disease. So the first step is we're going to integrate empirical data to estimate temperature-dependent R0 for 13 different vector-borne diseases. So we're going to create replicated um, parameterized R0 equations for 13 different systems so that we can compare and contrast. What are these temperature responses? Which are the traits that are driving similarities and differences across systems? We're then going to use the metabolic theory of ecology to try to develop some a priori theory that might predict what these temperature dependent models will look like, which we can then compare with our empirical models. So we can use the models as a test of metabolic theory. And what would be really helpful is if we could actually develop metabolic theory based models that we can extrapolate to future emerging diseases that we know less about. So that's the first kind of aim. The second aim is to validate some of these models, particularly for dengue and the other Aedes aegypti transmitted viruses uh, by collecting field data in Ecuador and in Kenya, and then using existing field data. So I'll talk a little bit more about val model validation in a second. Our third aim is to try to understand whether there's already been local adaptation of these mosquitoes. So in some cases, these vectors have really broad geographic ranges. And what we thought is that there might already be some evidence for local adaptation of thermal responses. So for example, populations from warmer areas might have warmer thermal optima. So we're going to be collecting mosquitoes from across the range. We're going to be collecting eggs, rearing them up in the lab, and doing controlled thermal response experiments across different populations to look for evidence of local adaptation. So I'm going to wrap up by just giving a quick example from this first part of another temperature-dependent R0 model for a really important additional system. And this is the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus transmitted viruses, so dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. Um, these are two mosquitoes that are really human-associated, particularly Aedes aegypti. 
it breeds in highly urban areas. It likes you know, human containers, even things like bottle caps and flower pots, buckets, tires. Um, these mosquitoes do really well around humans. And so that's led to these repeated emergences and, and sweeps of an infectious disease over the last several decades through the Americas. So we want to know how temperature affects transmission by these mosquitoes. So we're going to use the exact same method here. We find the data in the literature and fit the thermal responses, combine them into r naught, and then validate with field data. This is work that Daniel contributed to. I want to point that out. Um, so for Aedes albopictus and dengue, these are what the thermal responses look like. Um, so again, we see these unimodal thermal responses, very similar to malaria. This is what they look like for Aedes aegypti and dengue. Again, very similar thermal responses, unimodal. Um, for viruses, it's a little bit less clear whether the extrinsic incubation rate ever actually turns over or whether it's just that the mosquitoes never survive at those really warm temperatures. But either way, the effect on the model is the same. The other thing I want to point out is that there weren't enough data on chikungunya or Zika to measure these temperature responses. So that's a huge empirical data need that I know some people are working on addressing now. So we do the same thing. We combine these into our temperature-dependent r naught models. And for Aedes albopictus, we predict that the optimum is 26. And for Aedes aegypti, the optimum is 29 for transmission. And that's in part reflected, reflecting the fact that these viruses are able to continue developing quickly at warmer temperatures than the malaria was. So that's why the optima are a little bit warmer. <coughs> so, in contrast to the malaria system, where all the previous models made really consistent and similar predictions, the previous models in this system are all over the place. And there have been a lot of previous models looking at temperature-dependent transmission by these mosquitoes. So here I'm showing our Aedes aegypti model in black and our Aedes albopictus model in dashed lines, dashed black. And you can just see that the predictions are all over the place. Some of them are very similar to our model predictions. Some of them are way different. So they're predicting a 35 degree optimum which is just crazy in my opinion. But anyway, so we see all this variety in the models in the literature. The only one that's been statistically validated against independent transmission data is the Wesolowski model, which is in orange. Um, and that one actually pretty closely mirrors our model, you can see here, although it drops off at slightly cooler temperatures. So model validation was a really important objective for us. And it was a really difficult objective, to be honest here. So I mentioned that we got lucky for malaria because there were all these great mosquito transmission data just available sitting there waiting for us. For chikungunya, dengue, and Zika, there were not these great data. So what we had to work with were these independent human case data reported at the country scale. So we have several issues here. They're aggregated to the country scale, first of all. And they're human case data, which are several degrees removed from the actual transmission event. So these are the challenges with these data. But what we decided to try to do, oh, and these are from across the Americas from 2014 to 2016. What we decided to do was to ask whether temperature dependent or not predicted the probability of observing local transmission. And then given that we did observe local transmission, what was the magnitude of the incidence? So we decided that those things should at least be positive rela positively related to the number of human cases. So this is the validation approach that we used. So what I'm showing here is the probability, the posterior probability that R0 exceeds 0. So in other words, temperature is not completely excluding transmission. The probability that temperature is not excluding transmission times the log of the human population size. Because we figured that larger populations have more people, so more opportunities for outbreaks, and also probably have more people coming and going, so more exposure to potential outbreaks. And this is a logistic regression showing the probability of observing an outbreak in a given um, data set. We did the regression separately for dengue versus chikungunya and Zika because chikungunya and Zika had much lower incidence overall. So basically we had fewer positive data points to work with there. So what we see is that our r naught metric multiplied by population size did have a positive relationship with the probability of actually observing a, an outbreak in the field. So that was good. We also found that, at least for dengue, this model does a surprisingly good job of predicting when and where we should see outbreaks. So the out, this, this is all out of sample of, uh, validation. And the accuracy was about 88%. So it's actually doing a pretty good job for dengue. For chikungunya and Zika, because there were so many more zeros, the out of sample accuracy was lower. It was closer to 68%. So the second part is looking at whether predicted or not predicts the, the magnitude of incidence. And here we're looking at 
the, uh, the actual value of R0 times the population size. Because again, we figure that larger populations have greater opportunities for large outbreaks. And we're comparing that with the log of the incidents, so the number of new cases per week. And again, we see a positive relationship here. And again, the relationship is stronger for dengue than chikungunya and Zika. And again, we had pretty high um, accuracy. In this case, it was based on root mean squared error. And it was about 88% accuracy. So the models are, again, doing a pretty decent job given how coarse this data really is. So, of course, the models are not taking into account the human dimension, which is really important in these systems. Um, and this is one of the interacting aspects of global change that we're really starting to move towards trying to understand. These are things like urban population density, how much vector control effort there is, how much infrastructure. So a big thing with these mosquitoes is that when people don't have reliable access to piped water, they'll store water around the house and mosquitoes will breed in that water. So a big predictor of your risk is whether or not you're storing water around your house. Um, and then so socioeconomic factors in general. And these are things that I'm not going to talk about now, but we're working towards integrating these into these models. So to sum up this last part, Zika, dengue, and chikungunya have peak suitability for transmission between 26 and 29 degrees Celsius. 23 to 32 or so is about the permissible range. So I'm not showing the map right now, but um, in most of the Americas, throughout the tropical and subtropical region, we have suitable temperatures for most of the year. But we're predicting that that suitability really quickly declines as we go north in North America. So, for example, Michigan probably has suitability for two months a year or so, two or three months a year. And human activities de determine the actual risk. So the temperature suitability is sort of the envelope where we can observe transmission, and then human activities affect where we actually observe large outbreaks. Okay, so to wrap up, there are many aspects of global change that are interacting to affect infectious disease in most disease systems, including both human and natural ecosystems. Um, in the first section, I showed you that invader-driven pathogen spillover doesn't necessarily harm native species. And in the second section, I showed that vector-borne disease transmission is highest at intermediate temperatures. And so in both cases, the point I want to make is that the outcome can often be subtle. It's not necessarily true that just global change means worse disease outcomes. Um, and that because of this complexity and nonlinearity, it's really important to disentangle how these interacting drivers are inf influencing the disease system. So um, I want to wrap up by simply talking about, again, diseases are embedded in ecological communities, and nonlinearity is really important. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. And thanks for your attention. Yeah. Was the mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, um, yeah, that's a great question. So he asked about the transmission dynamics of the black fingers of death because we measured that in petri dishes, which is very different from nature, as you might expect. Um, so what I didn't show just for simplicity of the figure, we, um, we had those experimental data where we were able to actually manipulate the density of each seed species. But we also used, as priors in the model, some field data where we basically looked at the correlation between seed density and the density of infected seeds. So we are using a little bit of field data there, but um, the, the transmission process itself was parameterized in the lab experimentally. But basically, the way transmission works is those black fingers make spores that sort of fall off or jump off the, the seeds and just sort of rain down around them. So I think transmission really is a pretty local scale process. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if it was contained, for the most part, within these small, you know, the, the size of the things was about this big. So, um, of course, it's possible that you could get occasional long distance dispersal of spores, but I think for the most part, the spore load on an individual seed is related to how many infected seeds are right around it. Annette? I was wondering with that study <coughs> about whether your model factored in age in any way, and, and if you think it, it could be important to think about that. Yeah, that's a great question. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, we basically assumed that we, could, that we knew the competitive neighborhood and that it was one meter squared. Um, so we didn't try to address space at all in that model. Um, I do think there could be interesting spatial dynamics, particularly if you're comparing like rangeland areas that are heavily grazed with protected areas and burned areas. So fire is a really big important driver also. 
Um, so we weren't we weren't specifically interested in spatial processes, so we decided to just ignore them. But I think it would be an area for future work. Do those images have like patches of the research at all, or is there kind of something? Well, they're patchy, but mostly because of like the disturbance history. Um, so like they're patchy because they're all within the fenced area. Um, it's not so much that they're like in parts of the fenced area and not in par other parts. Yeah, good question. But it's also they're probably of similar ages and things like that. So it's a little bit hard because the remnant native grasses are so rare at this point that we can only really work with them in the areas where they still exist. Yeah? Are there any prominent game predators? Yes. Um, from what I understand, the prominent seed predators only become prominent sometimes, and there are these Jerusalem, Jerusalem crickets that come in, and it sounds like one of Noah's plagues. Like, they're just like Moses' plagues? Wait, who, who had the plagues? Moses. Moses. I'm sorry, Moses. Um, <laughs> It's like a, it's literally like a biblical plague. Like these things come in and they just defoliate the entire area. And it's one of those things like you better hope that that doesn't happen during your field year because you're not going to have any data and you will have to run to your car to escape. But I mean, really, so like those are the main. I mean, there could be some rodents, but we don't really see a huge evidence for seed predation there um, in normal years, except when you have these crazy cricket outbreaks. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Yeah.